Father, we just thank you for this evening, Lord. Thank you for the time of worship. And now, Lord, I just ask that you would be blessed in our attention to your word as we uh, open it and consider what you have as we continue in this story. Lord, help us to make application for our lives, Lord. And we just thank you for this time of fellowship with you and with one another. And now, Lord, we just yield to what your spirit wants to do here tonight. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can open to Job chapter 11. Moving right along, we'll be done no time. <clears throat> Job chapter 11. So when we were in chapter 9, one of the interesting things is that Job was making the case that he really couldn't speak to God. He couldn't really argue his case before God. And then we got into chapter 10, and Job found his voice and spent a whole chapter pleading with God. And now in chapter 11, we meet the third of Job's so-called friends, and we hear what he has to say to Job, what his counsel is. And then beginning in chapter 12, we hear multiple, will be in multiple chapters of um, Job's response. And so tonight we're going to hear this third friend. We'll, we'll go into chapter 12 tonight and hear the beginning of that response, but not we won't, we'll finish it <clears throat> over the next week or two. So let's just jump in here. Verse 1. It says, Then Zophar the Naamathite answered and said, Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be vindicated? Should your empty talk make men hold their peace? And when you mock, should no one rebuke you? For you have said, my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in your eyes. So he goes right after him, as his other friends did. Kind of lays some heavy accusations, sharp barbs, throws them Job's way. And he really says something here that Job never really said of himself. But we see three things in particular that Zophar accuses Job of. One, that he's guilty of sin. Two, that he's ignorant of God. And three, he's stubborn in his refusal to repent. Because we're going to see Zophar mainly thinks that is exactly what Job needs to do. Now, Job's going to address all three of those accusations. In chapter 12, we'll see Job affirm God's greatness. In chapter 13, he's going to affirm his own innocence. In chapter 14, he'll ask, why should I repent when I have no hope? So here we see Zophar begins his accusations, and he says that Job was a man full of talk, and that his words were empty, and that they were a mockery. Now, it needs to be said that much of what Job has spoken about God hasn't been true. And so there is some room here for accusation. The things that he said about himself were not true either because he was not totally pure before God. We were told he was a righteous man, but not that he was innocent. So in fighting for his integrity, he had given the impression that he was sinless. And the truth is that can't be said of anyone. Paul made sure that we understood that when he wrote in Romans chapter 3, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. And he goes on to say, they have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. And I think those are good verses to remember in a witnessing situation. Because what you do is you kind of even the ground between you and the person that you're speaking with. You're not taking the high road. You're not appearing more righteous than you should as you speak when you bring those verses into play because what you're telling that other person is we have the same roots. And it's sin. It's just that you found the answer to that and they need to know it. Good verses to know. Let's pick up in verse 5. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against you, that he would show you the secrets of wisdom, 
for they would double your prudence. Know therefore that God exacts from you less than your iniquity deserves. Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Shul, what can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he passes by in prisons and gathers to judgment, then who can hinder him? For he knows deceitful men. He sees wickedness also. Will he not then consider it? For an empty-headed man will be wise when a wild donkey's colt is born a man. Interesting way of wording things. So Zophar here, he accuses Job of being ignorant of God. And his request in verse 5 there, that God would speak and open his lips against, well, that's going to be answered in chapter 38. But ironically, it will be Job's friends rebuked by God and not Job. God will actually commend Job at that point. And I think it's interesting just in our own lives how we often encourage people you know, to wait on God, to listen for God's still small voice, to seek out what he has to say. But if we're going to counsel somebody of that to, in that direction, then we need to be willing to hear what God says as well. It's really easy to tell another person to listen to God, but sometimes it's quite a task to want to listen to God because we don't know what he's going to say, or maybe we do, and we just don't want to hear it. So far, wishes here that God would show Job the secrets of wisdom, he says there in verse 6. And then he says that it would be double prudence. Double prudence, kind of an interesting set of words. What's the meaning there? Well, perhaps he's pointing out that God's wisdom is full and complete, or that God has twice as much wisdom as Job think he, thinks he has. But the phrase also, and I think this is the more accurate, the phrase can also be translated True wisdom has two sides. On the one side, there's the wisdom of God that we see. And on the other side, which I would say is the much, much, much larger side, is the things that only God can see. And I think that really sums up a lot of what this book is showing us so far. To know that what we see is so limited compared to what God sees. And really just explains, again, how we have to sit in our situation with faith that God's at work. Because we can't possibly know what he sees. We can't possibly know what he's doing. Not completely. We can't possibly make sense of so much of our circumstance. But that doesn't have to be thought of in the negative. I mean, when we talk like that, we're always thinking about the problems that we have. The tribulations that we go through. And we can't understand why. Or we don't know how things are going to turn out. Or... What could be the bigger picture? But let's look at the blessings too. Let's look at the good things. The fact that God's picture of what's happening is so much bigger. How much he's protecting us from that we don't know. How many ways that he's blessed us, hedged us in, did things for us that we have no idea. And so we, we need to weigh those as equally important. What he knows about our tribulations, what he knows about the blessings that we're receiving. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. It's a neat verse. Secret things belong to the Lord, but those things that he reveals to us belong to us and our children forever. Which really just speaks, one, that God does reveal things to us, that the things he reveals to us have a permanence because he has shown us. And then they belong to us, which means we have some responsibility then as God reveals things to us, to do something with what we're shown. Now, Zohar also expresses a desire that Job would understand the vastness of God. That's a pretty big job. The deep things of God, the limits of the Almighty. You know, Paul prayed something similar to that as well in chapter 3 verse 18 and 19 of Ephesians Paul prayed that we would be able to comprehend with all the saints 
what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. So in a sense, he's really wishing something upon Job that God himself, the Holy Spirit, would wish that we would endeavor to do, to know his fullness, to know his love. Now in saying these things, Zophar appears to be saying he has this vast understanding of God. I mean, the way that he spoke to, to Job, can you, can you, as if I can. So he's probably thinking more of himself than he ought to and at the center of what Paul was praying for us was the hope that we would understand that God dwells in our hearts by faith and that we would be rooted and grounded in his love. Now this friend of Job was sorely lacking that kind of wisdom because he certainly wasn't expressing any of God's love for Job. And we can see that very clearly in how he's speaking to him. At the root of Zophar's thinking was the belief that God had judged Job and therefore he must be guilty, and therefore he must repent. In verse 13, If you would prepare your heart and stretch out your hands toward him, if iniquity were in your hand and you put it far away and would not let wickedness dwell in your tents, then surely you could lift up your face without spot. Yes, you could be steadfast and not fear because you would forget your misery and remember it as waters that have passed away. And your life would be brighter than noonday, though you were dark, you would be like the morning. And you would be secure because there is hope. Yes, you would dig around you and take your rest in safety. You would also lie down and no one would make you afraid. Yes, many would court your favor, but the eyes of the wicked will fail and they shall not escape and their hope, loss of life. So Zophar seems to have this opinion about Job that he's just stubborn. He's just being stubborn. And he believes Job, as we've said, should confess and repent. <clears throat> and his only word of encouragement for Job is to have hope. Have hope. Now, to speak to another believer, to encourage them to have hope makes sense. But we need to make sure that person believes where their hope lies. And really, Zophar just hands it to Job kind of as an empty, an empty promise. He expresses his belief that if Job would just repent, he would experience God's abundant blessing and his troubles would disappear. He feels that if he did that, then Job could lift his head and he would no longer fear. Now, we need to note this. The demands that Zophar levels at Job are in line with the desires of Satan. If we've been following the story from the beginning, you'll understand that. He was tempting Job to bargain with God so he could get out of his troubles. And wasn't that what Satan wanted Job to do? Remember Satan's question for God? Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan assumed Job's faith was shallow. Satan believed Job's faith was connected to his material possessions, including his health. Satan believed that Job's faith expected prosperity in return for obedience. So to de obey the demands of Job's friends would have played right into the hands of Satan. But Job's faith was not what Satan imagined. Job's faith was solid enough that he would later say in chapter 13, Though God slay me, yet will I trust him. So he had a solid faith. That faith was being tested. And I think it's all right when we get into those times where we look around and we realize that's what's happening to us. Our faith is being tested. But Satan will come and sow doubt that your faith's not strong enough. That you need to increase your faith. And then we get into that really weird game that we play about faith. And we end up thinking, I, I, my faith must grow. And if my faith isn't strong enough, then i got to do something to increase it. And then we kind of chase this thing around the tree. We end up playing this game with ourselves that we're, we're, we're actually saying, I have faith in faith. Faith becomes the object instead of God. If we're going to improve our faith, our faith needs to be in the one that can do what we're asking, the only one. But if our faith is in faith, then you say, well, what's that look like? It's because I'm now working on it. 
Instead of asking for that help, that gift, I'm working on it. I'm going to increase my faith. And I'm going to put more coal on the fire and stoke that. And it becomes a work of the flesh, not a work of the Spirit. Our faith has to be in the one who can do what we're asking. And that's certainly not ourselves. Let's jump into chapter 12. Then Job answered and said, No doubt you are the people and wisdom will die with you. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Indeed, who does not know such things as these? I am one mocked by his friends who called on God and he answered him. The just and blameless who is ridiculed. A lamp is despised in the thought of one who is at ease. It is made ready for those whose feet slip. The tents of robbers prosper and those who provoke God are secure in what God provides by his hand. So Job now starts to speak, defending himself. He challenges his friend's assertion that they had more wisdom than he did. He then rebukes them for being so uncaring and for making him the object of their mocking. Job believed he was just and upright, which is exactly how God described him in the very first chapter of this book. Not innocent, not pure, but he was just and upright. Look at verse 7. And now ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you, or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain it to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Does not the ear test words and the mouth taste its food? Now earlier, Zophar claimed that wisdom was not accessible by man. But here, Job says that God's creatures could teach them what they need to know. Even the creatures know that God's hand made all things and is the source of all those things continuing. <clears throat> that makes me think of the, the words of the psalmist. Psalm 19, verse 1 and 2, where it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. God's creation speaks to us. He put the picture of himself in all that he's created and we see how great he is, even in a fallen world, in, a, in a, a fallen existence, we can still see the greatness of God. And as I always say, can you just imagine when it's all restored? Now, in the following verses, Job's going to describe the wisdom and power of God. And these verses are a rebuke to Job's friends who thought all their years of experience taught them what they needed to know. Verse 12 Wisdom is with aged men, and with length of days understanding. With him are wisdom and strength, he has counsel and understanding. If he breaks a thing down, it cannot be rebuilt. If he imprisons a man, there can be no release. If he withholds the waters, they dry up. If he sends them out, they overwhelm the earth. With him are strength and prudence. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away plundered and makes fools of the judges. He loosens the bonds of kings and binds their waist with a belt. He leads princes away plundered and overthrows the mighty. He deprives the trusted ones of speech and takes away the discernment of the elders. He pours contempt on princes and disarms the mighty. He uncovers deep things out of darkness and brings the shadow of death to light. He makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and guides them. He takes away the understanding of the chiefs of the people of the earth and makes them wander in a pathless wilderness. They grope in the dark without light and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. At that point, I would think Job's friends should have realized that this man that they were speaking to understood God very well. Now in verse 15, Job points out the complete sovereignty of God in relationship to nature. And then in verses 16 through 25, he points out the complete sovereignty of God in relation to people. 
What God destroys cannot be rebuilt. What he locks up cannot be released. God can send drought or flood and no one can stop him. God has the wisdom to know what to do, the power to accomplish it. And what's Job's point here? I believe his point is all kinds of people experience difficulties in life because God can do whatever he pleases. But we know that he's no respecter of persons. And he's not impressed by a person's rank or wealth or status. And that really leads us full circle back to what we discussed a moment ago. We don't know why God does what he does so often. And yet we have to just come to a point of being settled in the fact that he gets to and he can. That's the kind of thing that can drive a person crazy. It can make a person angry. And it can keep a person away from God because the fear they have for him is not the kind of fear the Bible tells us we should have. You know, Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, Jesus says, For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And so we can't disqualify ourselves from hard times. We can't say, because I, and fill in the blank, whatever you can think of, and say, because of that, God won't. God can. He might. And if he wills to do so, he will. We also see the sovereign hand of God over nations. And I think that's very interesting in the days that we find ourselves, to remember that. To remember that. He can enlarge or destroy a nation. He can grant it freedom. He can bring bondage into play. If God decides to remove wisdom from its leaders... A nation's destruction is sure. Sounds like, like current events, huh? All of this that God does really opposes the pride of man. And that's one of the reasons he pushes so hard, I believe, why he makes such giant correction in the ways of the world. I think that's why so many nations and people suffer. It's because God is pushing against and he's in the process of crushing that pride. I mean, pride is what built the Tower of Babel when you think back to that. And it's the same pride that has us again in our day attempting to build a tower into the heavens. We see it. Man is in the process once again of trying to depose God of his throne. Doing it through technology, He's doing it from the ways that he believes he's enlightened. And he's a fool to think that it's going to turn out any different than it has in the past. Because the effort has always failed. It's always led to destruction. And it will. And it is happening again. That's where we're going. That's the process that we're in. And really when you read the book of Revelation, you just see so much... You know, we go through the book of Revelation and we talk about God's wrath and we talk about Satan's wrath. And really, we'd have to go back to Romans chapter 1 to hear Paul's wisdom that God, in so many cases, is just turning us over to our own devices. That's when people ask me, do you think, do you think we're under judgment? Is, it, you know, is God taking his hand off this country? I can't answer that for sure, but what I do believe he is in the process and has been for a while is just turning us over to our own sin. He doesn't have to do much when the consequence of our own decisions are so great because we're destroying ourselves. Wow, those two chapters went fast. If I'd known that, I'd have went further. But I did, did want to bring us one more thing because thinking about this, the way that God works with nations took me to the Psalms again, in particular Psalm Two. If you, I'll give you a minute. You want to turn there with me? Psalm two. And this psalm speaks so clearly of where we're at, where we've been where we'll continue to go as we wait for the Lord's return. The psalmist begins with a question, why do the nations rage and the 
people plot a vain thing. Now understand, so often when it speaks of nations, it does apply to sovereign nations, but in a general sense, it speaks of the tribes of the earth, the people groups, is another way to look at it. Verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son today. I have begotten you. So this becomes a bit of a messianic psalm. God speaking of his son. Ask of me, verse 8, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Remember when Satan took Jesus up on an extremely high mountain and showed him all the nations of the world, which I believe was a picture of all the nations, not just them, but throughout history, and said that he would give them all of that if you just bowed down and worship him. And Jesus, of course, spoke from the scripture, spoke his own words, and didn't really have to play into that because all of them would be his someday. Verse 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron. We know that Jesus will rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So the nations have a choice. When we study the book of Samuel, we see that the Jewish people wanted to have a king like all the nations around them. And Samuel tried to dissuade them of such a decision and God told him no. Give, him, give them what they want. But Samuel levels a warning, and he tells them exactly what it's going to mean to have a king. And when you read that list of what he told them would happen, it's exactly what happened, it's exactly what happens today. It's, it, if you see our government as a king, if you can personify it in that way, then we see the exact same. God wished that he would be the king of his people. And as God's people, as believers, that needs to be our situation. And that's only in that way that we would serve God rather than man. That we would render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but render unto God what is God's. You know, I like that very last verse there in the psalm. When his wrath is kindled but a little. He doesn't even have to use all his wrath to bring about the changes that he wants. Unfortunately, he'll spare us that so we'll rest there for this evening. You guys get to go home early. <laughs>